that's the highest honor bestowed from the police department to a civilian. Right now on Denver Police News. It's quite extraordinary that she was able to do this. Honored. I was not expecting this at all. A local teacher saves the life of a child. It's like another part of you just takes over. Hear the story here. Then triumph. It's the happiest moment of my life so far. The happiest moment. We'll warm your hearts and introduce you to an amazing group of children. I'm just really excited. I've never done this before. So it's <laughs> a local group of foster kids learns to persevere and overcome. And finally, Denver may soon persevere and join the ranks of New York, Los Angeles, and other big cities around the country as we are well on our way to making and opening the doors to the Denver Police Museum. Get the sneak peek today and find out how you can help. Hello everybody and welcome to Studio A and Denver Police News. I'm Sergeant Steve Warnicke. Many consider teachers to be heroes because of the jobs that they do every single day. Here's the story of one teacher whose quick thinking and response has saved the lives of three different children and earned her one of Denver Police Department's highest honors. Well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'm Joe Montoya. I'm the uh, commander of District 3, which covers this area. Today, BJ Peebler will be receiving the commendatory letter from the Denver Police Department. That's the highest honor bestowed from the police department to a civilian. I'd like to ask BJ and uh, I was not expecting this at all. This is uh, how it reads. The death of a child can have a long term devastating effect on a community. Over the past three years, Betty Peevler, a teacher at the Denver Academy, has taken extraordinary actions to prevent tragedies to three young students. The first experience was in the lunchroom and I started to hear a little bit of a commotion at a table and I looked over and that's when I noticed one of the students was kind of grabbing at his throat. You know, I asked him, I said, are you choking? And you know, he gave me the look like, yes I am. He didn't know what to do at that point. I turned him around and gave him the Heimlich right there and then and out came the meatball and you know, I think in the moment, every time it's happened, it's like another part of you just takes over. Like it's not something you're thinking through. It's I need to do this and I need to do this now. The Denver Police Department would like to extend their thanks to Betty Peebler for her heroic actions. And this is signed by Robert C. White, Chief of Denver Police Department. <laughs> it's quite extraordinary that she was able to, to do this on, on three separate occasions. And maybe she's just the guardian angel for these children to be the one that's there in, in order to, to be able to do this. I think the biggest reward is probably the three kids that I know are going to be just fine and what could have happened to them. So, thank you. Congratulations to Miss Peebler and to her and all of the teachers. Thanks for everything you do. Here's a group of young adults who are familiar with doing. Today, we'll introduce you to some wonderful foster kids who, despite many hardships, have worked extra hard to make their goals a reality. Today is the 16th annual Celebration of Educational Excellence. It's a statewide celebration of our youth in foster care who have achieved high school graduation, high school equivalency diplomas. Came to the foster care system, been in this foster home for about two years. It's been working out, I had my ups and downs here, but I got myself on track. I left foster care when I was 18 and I got pregnant like the same month. So I want my son to know like, it, nothing can hold you back. Nothing. Graduation is hard enough for any of our youth in our society today. It's a big feat to overcome just being a teenager in this society. But we've got a group of kids in there who have overcome tremendous trauma, abuse, neglect. So they've overcome quite a bit to get here today. Norma Dominguez Olivas. I'm just really excited. I've never done this before. So it's cool. Noah Garcia. Feels like I actually made it, you know. Andrew Taylor. It's the happiest moment of my life so far. The happiest moment. When you set your standards high, I think it's better because you're not settling for something less than you deserve. I'm gonna go to college and uh, I'm gonna try to double major. Um, I'm going to go to a culinary school in Arkansas and get my life started there. <laughs> These kids are the kids that you see every day. You probably don't even know that they're in foster care. You probably don't know that they've been through such traumatic things in their life because they just keep going forward. They have no choice. They have to keep moving forward. 
I didn't think I was gonna graduate high school and now here I am, I'm actually doing it and I made it. Congratulations to all the kids that made it. That was a lot of hard work. Well, we've made it over to Studio B at Denver Police Headquarters and I'm joined by technician Dean Christofferson. Um, Dean, very few people in this department have meant so much to the museum project that's going on at the Denver Police Department um, than you. Can you tell us about what your vision is for this museum? Well, I, I've been lucky enough that uh, since we started this uh, program, we formed the 501c3 about almost six years ago now, and we've assembled a good team of volunteers, key people uh, who have become uh, integral components on the uh, formation of a police museum to honor the many thousands of officers that have served on this department in the last 154 years. Big cities have these. This, isn't, well, this won't be the first in the nation. In fact, we'll be falling in line with some of the bigger cities and some of the places where police museums already have a great impact on the community. Absolutely. Uh, some of the forerunners have been Los Angeles. Uh, uh, LAPD has a museum they've had for a number of years. Uh, Cleveland has had one. New York City's had one for quite some time. Uh, you look at Houston, Seattle, almost any major c metropolitan city has a museum of some type, whether in-house or in a freestanding location, uh, which is available for the public to come in and, and get a feel for what we do. Well, that's a great point. The museum is not just for police officers and their families. I mean, this does have an impact on the community and the citizens and, and adds some value to the community, I'd imagine. Absolutely. Uh, from day one, we decided this isn't going to be a shrine to the DPD, and it's not going to be a, uh, just a bunch of dusty old display cases in a corner. Uh, but what it's going to be is a, a view, a perspective of Denver's history as told through the Denver Police Department's eyes. What is happening now with the museum? Right now, uh, we've moved into our second phase, which is uh, we've moved into headquarters, uh, Suite 108, uh, first floor. That has enabled us to set up what's called our archiving and processing center and a business office. We are looking at cataloging and archiving all the different artifacts the department has that have been given to the uh, museum individually and a place for people to bring things in if they want to donate them and uh, have us catalog them. Is this open to the public right now? Uh, as of right now, it's not open to the public per se because we're behind the secure zone of the police headquarters, but uh, we will allow for some tours. We've given some youth group tours through there. Whenever there's been some functions at the department, we've had people come back. Uh, we'll try to get someone escorted back if we can, can do that at all. However, officers, of course, uh, can come back in. We're going to have regular business hours on Tuesdays from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. We're trying to have that staffed by volunteers, and we'll add more hours as we get more volunteers. So how can people help if they're interested in assisting you? Well, naturally, as a museum and as a 501c3 nonprofit, we didn't want to be a budget item for the city. We didn't want to take any resources away from patrol or equipment or cars, uh, and we didn't want to have to you know, face being cut maybe some year if they needed more police cars or equipment. So we are a 501c3, so we're naturally always looking for donations uh, financially. Uh, the other part we're also looking for is uh, donations of artifacts. Uh, a lot of retired officers, a lot of family of uh, officers have interesting items, and those are what tell the story of an officer. And it doesn't necessarily have to be just guns and badges all the time, but the little things, uh, little personal items that help humanize what an officer is or what he, what he had done in his career. Stories about the first black officer, the first female officer, the first officer killed in the line of duty, all of that stuff, um, it, it, it's relevant to the city. It's our history and, and it's important. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's not just the department's history, but it truly is the community's history. When you stop and think that we may have had anywhere from 8,000 to 10,000 officers that have served in various capacities in the last 154 years, that's a sizable amount of people. Um, and there's a lot of people in, in, in the city that have a a direct link, whether through family or friends, to the department. Uh, it's not unusual to have uh, generations that have served on the department, three or four, and, and again, just people who will constantly come up to me and say, you know, my grandfather was on the department, uh, or he served for a short period of time and something else changed in his life, so he wound up not having to do it. Uh, it, it it's an interesting story. Again, and every major event that's ever occurred in this city, the police department is there. I mean, we go. If a spaceship lands in the middle of, you know, uh, Colfax and Broadway, they're going to send the cops first. So we've always been pretty much the first people to get called for almost anything major. What will this mean to you personally when, when the museum's up, it's in its own space, it's open to the public, and all the hard work that you've put in comes to fruition? It's a legacy thing for the entire department. Uh, and for me, it's, it's a, the pride of being a Denver police officer and spending the last 23 years in law enforcement and to honor the, the 71 officers that are currently on our memorial right now. Uh, their legacy needs to be protected. Uh, and, and it has to be carried on from generation to generation to ensure that 
that we know their sacrifice, that we know where we came from. Any organization or group or, or any entity that forgets where it came from is often going to forget where it's going and not have an understanding and not have a way to pursue that uh, in a fashion and, and learn from its past mistakes and successes. Well, I can't think of a better way to showcase the amount of effort that you've completed so far other than for you to just take us on a short tour. Would you mind doing that? No, absolutely. I mean, uh, law enforcement is, is just one of the most fascinating things in the public's eye. If you look at the top 10 movies at any given time, the top television shows, periodicals, uh, magazines, everything crime drama driven. Just take a look at the, the starting lineup for any network television uh, roster um, and you'll see that people are fascinated by our, our type of business. And uh, we just want to give them an accurate and, and uh, true portrait of what we do from behind the scenes and mm -hmm. how we interact. Let's give everybody a sneak preview, shall we? So this is it. We have a combination of city-owned artifacts and privately owned by the, the museum. Uh, we have entered into a contractual agreement with the city and county of Denver and the police department to inventory and catalog their items. One of the first things we have to look at to get grants and loans is that what type of collection do we have. And as of right now, all we can say is there's some stuff in a closet, some stuff over here, things are coming in constantly. So we want to have a complete accurate inventory list of what the department has and what we have and then eventually both those will marry up for display down the road. This is uh, some of our intake that is coming in. Uh, every item that comes in will get a receipt to the individual who uh, donated it. Some of it's as simple as uh, a, a baton and, uh, and a badge that uh, their ancestor may have worn at one time. This one happens to be from World War II from the uh, Civil Defense Police. During World War II, we were short uh, on manpower because every able-bodied man was fighting in the war. So they had civil defense and auxiliary police, uh, four platoons of 40 apiece. And I mean, this isn't something that uh, is issued nowadays. No, definitely not. And uh, so the family um, donated the uh, items and uh, thought that it was a great place for them. Again, uh, sworn in as a police officer during World War II. They would put in uh, one of the uh, civil defense officers with a full-time officer and then have two-man cars even during World War II. So again, just a small part of the history of the department. Uh, but again, uh, several hundred of these people did serve in the department and take the same risk that a regular officer did in the course of a night. Now these weren't around when I started, but this is an important part of Denver police history. Exactly. This, uh, this uh, call box was stationed, as you can see, it's, it's call box 114. And uh, it was used from about the night, probably the turn of the last century all the way up until the late 1960s uh, when the final ones were phased out. Uh, but even back during the 50s, before we had personal radios, uh, this is how you responded to a call. You'd simply pick this up, click it a couple of times, and you'd call in on your beat. And if there was something you needed to be dispatched to, they would send you over. Every half hour or every hour, you'd check in on the corner call box. This dates from the earliest wow, uh, police Wow, look force. at that. Uh, this is probably 18, uh, 1870, 1871, and this would have been a uh, uniform worn. Uh, the, this uniform was worn by one of our uh, earliest law enforcement officers, Robert Yardley Force. He was also a deputy sheriff because we were part of Arapahoe County at that time. And then he actually was appointed chief of police for about a week and a half or two weeks in 1877. Wow, that uh, is a neat piece of history, yeah, for real. He had, he had been one of our original first three policemen in the city of Denver. We have a uh, retired detective who flagged me down when he found out about the museum project. His daughter had worked actually in Weld County as an intern a couple of years ago. And she remembered clearing out the inventory room of that uh, sheriff's department. And she said she distinctly remembered finding badge number two that said Denver on it. So we were a little intrigued by that, so I got a hold of the Weld County Sheriff, sent a request up there, and asked if they in fact did have one. He said, yes, we have it on display, and he said, absolutely, you can have it back for your museum and for your department's history. This style of badge was worn from 1890 to 1896. In some prior research I had done at the State Archives, I had found the original handwritten ledger of the officers appointed to service and their dates. So we were able to find star number two, which belongs to Casey Martin. It lists his start dates, hire dates, where he was assigned, 
It showed how many gold buttons he was given from the department to wear in his uniform, what his nightstick number was, and what his call box key was. Higher dates and when he finally resigned. That led me to the fact that I could, was able to find out more information from a, someone who would recapped the book. He actually had served on the department since about 1880, and then he retired in 1909. And the reason we know that is because his obituary we were able to locate, which shows that he died in 1911 and he retired in 1909. So the, the dilemma that we have, though, is that the records are scattered everywhere. Some are at the State Archives, some are at the Denver Public Library, some are in the department, a lot of them are in private collections, some are at History Colorado. So there's no one centralized source to go to to tell the story of this one item. You have to go to multiple uh, sources to get that information. Our goal one day is to have a research library that a family member or an artifact comes in, be able to track it down, be able to go right to a, a, a list of uh, resources that tell that time frame, and we'll be able to figure out who it belonged to. Well, you got your work cut out for you, for sure. We absolutely do, but it, it's a great project, and, and I think it's going to work out it pretty is. good. Thanks for everything you're doing. You bet. Thanks Thank for you, your time. Sir. All right. Thank you. All right. We'll see you soon. Thank you, everybody, for being with us on Denver Police News. I'm Sergeant Steve Warnicke. We'll see you next time.